Come on, the church. Hallelujah. He's alive. Come on, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you again for yet another chance to worship and praise you. And we thank you so much for this Easter Sunday that we can come and simply celebrate the fact that you chose to die, but that you rose again today and that you are alive, Lord. You are alive, Lord, and we thank you for being that. We thank you for being the only true God and for allowing us to know you and have the chance to have a relationship with you. Lord, we pray for anyone today that doesn't know you today, Lord, that they would not leave this day unchanged, that they would come away from this service, from any service, or just from being around and hearing about you today, Lord, that they would be changed and that they would want to know more about you. Lord, we pray that we would all affect someone in that way where someone would want to get to know more about you, that we would treat and show everyone all kinds of love at all times, no matter who they are, no matter where they come from, and to keep you at the center of it all. Lord, again, we just celebrate the fact that you rose from the dead and no one else has ever done that. And there is no other God that is alive, Lord. It's only you. You are the only living God. And we worship you and praise you for that. We thank you for the sacrifice so long ago. And we just shout hallelujah because you are worthy to be praised. Lord, I pray that you bless this entire service and all that's going to go on in it, that we all be blessed, that we all receive what you want us to receive, and that you would simply be glorified above all and by all. Lord, I know I believe in some day at some point we're going to see that in our lives, Lord, and we're going to see so many more people come to worship you and come to glorify you. And Lord, I pray that it happens at this time during this time of all this change that we're going through, Lord. But Lord, if not, we will praise you. We will continue to praise you. We will not let the rocks cry out. We will praise you ourselves. Father God, we thank you. We love you. We honor you and we shout again that you are alive and hallelujah. In Jesus' name we pray and say amen, amen. Yeah. 
it's time for offering. And to support the ministry, click on the Give button that takes you directly to our PayPal, where you can donate by debit or credit card. And if you're giving by check, you can send that to Infinity Bible Church at 1326 Morrison Avenue, Bronx, New York, 10472. Let's go before God in prayer. Father, thank you for the cheerful giver. We thank you for every seed that's sown into this ministry that allows us to spread the message of hope through Jesus Christ. We ask that you would bless this offering and bless those that could give. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. It is Easter Sunday, and he is alive. Hallelujah. He has risen. Hallelujah. I know that we're not able to worship physically together today, but we are all gathered together in our different parts of the city and a little beyond, and we are celebrating the fact that Lord, Lord Jesus Christ is alive. He rose from the dead. I want to read today John's account of this in John chapter 20, verses 1 through 9, and it reads, Now the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the temple, went to the tomb early while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciples, other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first and he stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with linen cloths, he but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed, for as yet they did not know the scripture that he must first rise again from the dead. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, 2,000 years later, we celebrate the fact that you didn't just come to the earth, live a perfect life, although you did, and you didn't just die on the cross for our sins, although you did. You conquered death when you rose from the dead. Lord, may we be encouraged today that the power that raised you from the dead 2,000 years ago will one day raise all of us to be eternally with you, all of us who have trusted you as our Lord and Savior. And Lord, for anyone who is listening that has not made that decision to trust you, to turn their life over to you, I pray they would ask you today to be their Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Bible is sort of a big book that has maybe, you want to say 16, uh, 66 books in it, 66 volumes, 66 chapters. The Old Testament has 39 books. The New Testament has 27 books. Now, when you get to the New Testament, the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those first four books we commonly call them the Gospels. And those Gospels are basically giving us the life of Christ, the life of Jesus, their narratives, their history. You'll see his miracles. You'll see in a couple of them his birth. You'll see the parables that he told and, and um, four different books, four different authors 
all of the authors, none of them contradict each other, but they all have their own distinct perspective. And Luke, by the way, is a doctor. So if you want to see a lot about medical stuff, read the Gospel of Luke. Um, John focuses on his deity. And again, no contradiction between John and Luke. They're just different perspectives. Jesus performs hundreds and whole hundreds of miracles during his earthly ministry. All of them are not recorded in the Bible. And yet some of them are. And interestingly, every gospel writer did not include the same miracles. They're different. Did you know that only Matthew and Luke record the birth of Christ? Did you know that only the book of John Talk about the resurrection of Lazarus, where, when Jesus raised him from the dead. However, when you want to talk about the resurrection of Jesus, all four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they all talk about um, his resurrection from the dead. It's that important, and it is stated in all four books in different ways, nothing contradicting. I've chosen to read the account in the Gospel of John uh, where Peter and John run to an empty tomb. There are a lot of other accounts I could have read. Now, the resurrection of our Lord Jesus is the defining event of Christianity. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, everything he said during his life is meaningless. It all unravels. I had, years ago, there was a young man in our after-school program, and for whatever reason, he was a little older, and he did not like attending the after-school anymore. It was spring, he wanted to leave, and so he would just leave. He, like in the middle of the after-school program, he would take off. Well, obviously, um, we can't have that for a bunch of reasons. Number one, there's safety issues. If he takes off and something happens to him, then, then I felt like I was responsible. And two, um, the, a matter of discipline. If he takes off and we do nothing, then what's to stop all of the other kids from taking off? But we didn't quite know what to do with that. It's just, you know, in a thing, and he's just gone. And so one day I was talking him, to him and scolding him and saying, hey, you can't do that anymore. It's not going to happen. And as I was talking to him, as I was speaking to him, he bolted out the door and he's gone and he's fast. Now, this was a while ago, eight, eight or more years ago. And I, you know, I, I was old then. I'm older now and I can't sprint. He's, but I took off after him and I can't sprint, but I can run. And I, and I, back then, and even now I, I run distance daily. It's nothing. It's normal for me to run a couple miles. And so I knew if I could just keep him in my sight, if he would tire, I would have a chance of catching up with him. So he was sprinting halfway up Morrison Avenue, running toward Bronx River, and I'm running. And then, and then I, and he's getting ahead of me. And then I realized, wait a minute, he's not getting ahead of me anymore. And then I realized, wait a minute, I'm catching up with him. And he's looking back, and he realizes I'm catching up. And by the time I got to 174th or so, he crosses the street. I'm right behind him. And then before he could even get to the projects, I got him. And I grab him by, I got him by the collar, I believe. And I'm dragging him. And he's coming back to school. He will not win this. And all of a sudden, a very smart young man, he says, help, help. I don't know this man. Well... <laughs> As you can imagine, it stirred up quite a fuss, and there's a crowd that begins to gather around us, and I all of a sudden knew, I thought I was on offense, but I immediately knew I had to play defense, and I, I said, wait a minute, let's stop, I let him go. You don't know me, some of you know me, but many, and he kept saying, oh, regain their confidence, because he had proved, he had proven that he was a liar. So Jesus said that he would rise from the dead, and he didn't rise from the dead. He was a liar, and nothing else he said has any value. I'm going to give you 
for um, principles today, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, four things that that means. And number one, we've talked about if he did not rise from the dead, number one, Jesus was a liar. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 21, we see how clearly he told his disciples that he was going to rise from the dead. Now, they did not necessarily grasp it, understand it, but he clearly said it. Matthew 16, 21 reads, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. If he lied about rising from the dead, we can't trust anything else he said. So if he did not rise from the dead, he's a liar and completely untrustworthy if he did not rise. Number two, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, he cannot be a way of salvation. Not possible. Now, have you ever heard people use this? It's, it's, it's a philosophy that I don't, it, it's, it's not true, but we've heard people say it. You know, getting to heaven is kind of like climbing a mountain. There are many roads that lead to the top of the mountain, but as long as you're on one road and going up, you're going to get there just like heaven. So it doesn't really matter if you're on the Muslim road or on the Hindu road or on a Baptist road or on a Mormon road, whatever road you take, you know, they all kind of lead to heaven and you're going to be over, you're going to get there. Now, let me just say this. I, that's, that's ridiculous. We're going to get to that in a minute. But even if it were true, even if there were many he couldn't be, he wasn't who he be, and you'll get to heaven, comes to be a reasonable explanation for where his body ended up after he died. Where did his body go? Now, let me describe briefly what a crucifixion was, what it meant if someone was crucified. Number one. When Jesus was crucified, he was scourged. Now, scourging was a beating, usually with a whip, sometimes with a with a with a stick. And if you study the Old Testament, when they talk talked about punishing someone who had committed a certain crime, one of the ways they would punish that person would be to whip them. And the Old Testament law was very precise, and it said that no one could be whipped more than 40 times. And so, and if someone was whipped more than 40 times, according to tradition, whoever, whoever did that would have to be whipped that same amount of times. So the Jews were always careful not to whip anyone more than 40 times. In fact, the tradition was, just in case I guess they miscounted, they would never whip them more than 39 times. And it's very likely when Jesus was scourged, that whip went across his back 39 times. And it, I, can't, I don't think we can imagine the beating he took before he got to the cross. So he was scourged. He was punched and mocked, the scriptures say. His hands were nailed to the cross. His feet were nailed to the cross and he suffered and he bled on the cross for six hours. Excruciating pain. He bled and when the crucifixion was over, the soldiers put a spear and they put it into his side. When, when they took him down from the cross, he was wrapped in, in linen cloths that were that were anointed, soaked with spices, and, and put in a rich man's tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. And probably if it was typical, the spices would have weighed about a hundred pounds. So he was wrapped with linen and, and spice weighing a hundred pounds, and he was laying, he was laid in a tomb. 
And that, that tomb was a small room that they literally cut out the side of a mountain. My wife and I saw what was very possibly his tomb or certainly what was like his tomb when we visited Jerusalem last year. Really a remarkable carving right out of the mountain. And and it was it was you we were it was big enough where a person could step in there and kind of stoop. They would they would put the body, they would lay out the body. And then once they put the body in that was anointed and with with the spices and wrapped with the cloth, they would then, of course, leave the tomb. And then they would would take a a stone and roll the stone in front of the entranceway. The entranceway would have been, you know, five, five feet, four and a half, five feet. And then that would completely cover the entrance to the tomb so that no wild animal could get in there. And they would also uh, where the stone was rolled. um, to cover the entrance of the tomb, they would they would in, in the uh, in the they would put a little groove down there, a little a little um, opening, so that when they when they rolled the stone down, it would it would like settle into that groove. So the stone the stone was just set there. Um, I remember when my um, my beautiful bride and I were on our honeymoon. Somehow we were driving in 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 uh, we had a little cottage in in, in a wooded area and. One of my tires got stuck in in the sand, in in the in loose dirt. And the more I tried to get it out, the more it spun. You've heard we've all experienced in the snow or in the dirt. Zzz. And pretty soon that 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 tire is kind of buried. Well, that's if you can imagine that tire in that little in that little opening. That's the stone was rolled into a similar opening. So once it, and by the way, the stone weighed somewhere between two thousand and three thousand pounds. So once that stone was was rolled in front of that tomb in that in in, in a little groove, it, it wasn't going anywhere. As a matter of fact, it was said that if they wanted to move it out, it would take 20 or more men to actually move it out of an opening like that. It was there. It was there to stay. Remarkable thing. Um, and so if the dead were not raised, where did his body go? We know he was, he was, he was very bad, but they took him off before he'd actually died and they and they took him and they wrapped him and they put him in from of the from the sea outside. Which rulers knew that Jesus scriptures teach us that while while they were going, this is the, the soul to the city and reported to the chief priests all the things that had happened. When they assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave them a large sum of money to the soldiers, saying, Tell them. His disciples came at night and stole him away while he slept, while we slept. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make sure, make you secure. So they took the money and did as they were instructed. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. That saying was that his disciples came and stole the body while the soldiers were sleeping. That was the rumor that went out. That was the explanation for the empty tomb. Now, let me dispel that one also. The Roman Empire had a very strict code, code of conduct for their soldiers, that if you fell asleep while you're on guard duty, they would execute you. So soldiers didn't fall asleep while they were on guard duty, and certainly four to 16 soldiers wouldn't all have fallen asleep. It makes no sense. And even if they had, all of them had fallen asleep, they would have to, had to remain asleep while his disciples and certainly some helpers with the 11 disciples that remained after Judas was gone. While they rolled the stone away, that, two and a half, that one ton or one and a half ton stone, while they did that, they would have had to remain asleep. While Jesus' disciples rolled that heavy stone, that's not going to be a silent act, and then rolled it away and then removed the body without them waking up. This, this, you know, it's such a ridiculous theory. And then they, and then they would have, their explanation was we fell asleep knowing that that explanation, 
explanation could have them executed. That's why the religious rulers said, hey, don't worry about it. We know how bad this looks. We know they might execute you, but don't worry about it. We'll talk you know, to the Roman people and we'll make it good. And even then the soldiers said, yeah, OK, we'll do it. But we need some money. So they actually, on top of all of them, bribed, bribed. And so, you know, what, this is what this is what this reminds me of when I was uh, my wife and I were younger. We were visiting, but we, we were married and we were visiting uh, my house. And at that time, I wore contact lenses. I could never get used to them. But I, I was wearing contact lenses at the time. And, and, and as you do at night, you take them out and you put them in. You got you got little containers. They're little, little tiny container. You take them out and, and, and you put each lens in, in one, the right lens in the right container, the left lens in the left container. So the next day I went up, I went out and I, I woke up and, and I went to the container and both of my contact lenses were gone. They were gone. I opened it up. No contact lens on the right, no contact lens on the left. They were gone. I remember clearly putting them in there. They were gone. Now, I had a 10-year-old brother at the time. He's older now. And, and I'm like, well, you, what'd you do? Come to the bathroom and get into my contact lenses? Where are my lenses? He, and he does, to this day, he denies it. Um, I said, where are they? Where are I? No, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. And so I told my mom, I'm like, look, my contact lenses are gone. You know, my brother took them. And he said, no, I didn't. He denied it vehemently. And mom and my mom said, well, maybe Pedro took them. Well, OK, folks, Pedro was their dog. I said, yeah, mom, that's right. Pedro did it. Pedro put his front legs on top of the sink, the bathroom sink. He opened the right side, took out the contact lens. He opened the left side of the container for my contacts. And then he took that one out as well. And then Pedro closed the container. That's right. Pedro took my contacts. Now that obviously that makes no sense. And Jeff, if you're watching this, I still know you did something when you were 10, but I forgive you. That makes as much sense as Roman soldiers saying, we know that on penalty of death, we fall asleep. Yet we fell asleep watching Jesus's tomb and even when the disciples and helpers came and moved that stone and took a long time doing it, that would be it. We still didn't wake up. That's what happened. Or the swoon theory. Oh, yeah, Jesus didn't really die, but somehow he unwrapped his own grave clothes and had the strength of 20 men push after being crucified and push the stone away. It makes no sense. We should call both of those the Pedro the dog theory because that's as much sense as they make. Number four, if Jesus, uh, point number four, last point, if Jesus did not rise from the dead, you and I have no hope of ever rising from the dead. Our entire hope of heaven is completely ultimately based on the resurrection, the physical resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. In, ver in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 14 through 19, Paul writes this regarding the resurrection to the Corinthians. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty. And your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he did not raise if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not raised risen, or risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most pitiable. You see, if Jesus didn't rise, 
What's the basis for saying that you and I will never rise from the dead? Matter of fact, he says, if we're believing that, we, we are of all men most pitiable. But, you know, I'm glad. And I'll, let me close out this with this Easter message with this. I'm so glad that the dead do will rise because Jesus did rise from the dead. I'm glad that Paul didn't stop with verse 19. Verse 20, he says, but now Christ is risen from the dead. Hallelujah. But you see, believing the resurrection is not enough to make you a true follower of Christ, and it's not enough to get you to heaven. So if you're watching this and you have never asked the Lord to save you and take control of your life, that's something you need to do. You need to, number one, admit that you sinned. Romans 3.23 spells it out, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Number two, you need to believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for all of your sins. Romans 5, 8 says this, for God demonstrates his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I should have paid for my sins eternally by spending an eternity in hell, but Jesus paid for my sins when he hung on the cross. So you have to admit you're a sinner. You have to believe that Jesus died and took your punishment. And number three, you simply have to ask Jesus to save you, change you, give him permission to take control of your life. That's what the Bible calls salvation. Then giving him permission, we call that repentance. And Romans 10, 9 says this, if we confess with our mouth, Jesus says, Lord, and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. And the Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So I don't care how bad you've been. I don't care what sins you've committed. Um, there's nothing you've done that he can't deliver you from and save you and forgive and cleanse and give you a home in heaven. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that we celebrate Easter where you, you didn't just die on Friday, you rose from the dead. Thank you for this truth. Nothing else makes sense. But Lord, your rising makes total sense. It is, our, it is our hope. It is our confidence. It is our assurance. Thank you that you rose from the dead. And Lord, as believers today, of all the days in the year, we rem even though we're separated today as a church, together we are celebrating this, this moment. Thank you that you rose from from the dead. Now, if you're listening to me right now and you've never asked the Lord to save you and you want to do that, I'm going to, I'm going to pray a prayer um, and, and give you a chance um, to pray with me as I pray. Um, it's a very simple prayer. And, and you would pray a prayer or something like this, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. Just pray that right along out loud in your heart. If you've never asked the Lord to save you, pray that right now. Lord, I know I'm a sinner. And Jesus, I believe you died on the cross for my sins, all of my sins, and that you rose from the dead. Again, Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for all my sins and rose from the dead. Just pray those words and mean it. And then finally, Lord, today, Easter Sunday, 2020, I am asking you to come into my life save me, change me, be my Lord, be my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you just prayed that prayer, as you're watching this, you can see a, a, a circle where you can like click and, and send a request. If you just asked the Lord to save you, would you please just right now click that request and indicate that you are asking that you have to connect with you because if you just be made that decision, um, it is day one of the Christian walk and we don't want you to miss any of the good things God has in store for us. So please click that right now, fill out all the information um, that will be available uh, that, that, that you're comfortable giving us. Uh, I, I appreciate so much all of you watching this message today. Again, what a, what a memorable Easter it is today, right? Kind of weird, not together, very sad, 
Um, sometimes when we come to, ch to church, it's so full on Easter. But let me just say this. I, I know we've got people watching, not just from um, New York, but we got people watching all, all over the country. Be encouraged today. The Savior that died for our sins 2,000 years ago rose from the dead, and he is alive. So whether you're worshiping somewhere in California or in South Carolina, or whether you're with most of us in the Bronx, um, he is risen from the dead. God bless you. We will see you next week. Walk with God in the meantime.